Oh boy. So, sometimes you got to play with things a little bit, you know, like it's art, right? So you can't just be like firm with everything, you know, you can't be just locked in other than your commitment to getting the story told, you know? The desire, your determination to get it done no matter what, sometimes you got to mess around a little bit and deal with the reality of the world around you, you know? Like sometimes things just don't work out the way you expect them to work out. Um, sometimes things don't happen the way you're expecting them to happen, and so you have to adjust, you have to be flexible. You know, flexibility might be one of the most important things in life, period, for just about anything. You know, if you're a runner, you better be flexible. If you're just a person, you know, going through your life and dealing with things that might happen to you, you better be flexible, you better do some strength work and be strong enough to deal with the obstacles and the surprises that might inevitably show up. Not might, they're going to show up. And so, I say all that to say, just for example, what if you were shooting a film and the story takes place in the dead of winter? And I'm talking like crazy snow, ice hanging off your eyelashes and, you know, your lips and your hands are freezing and, you know, all this dramatic winter kind of stuff. And then what if it's been like over 50 degrees through February in the northeastern part of the United States? And that's where you happen to be shooting. What if that happens? I mean, I guess you could pick up and travel somewhere and do it elsewhere. But if you don't have it like that, and if you don't have, you know, that kind of budget, um, you have to figure out a way to tell that story. Now, I'm assuming that the story that you're telling is something that you are absolutely compelled to, sell, to, to tell. Like, you can't live another day without telling this story. Like, you need to share this with as many people as possible. Like, it's something that is meaningful and important to you because, you know, you can't account for how other people feel. But you could just put it out there and, you know, in my opinion, you have no business putting anything out there unless you really feel like you absolutely need to share that story. Because that's the only way you're going to really serve it and do the best that you can. And so, I'm just saying, I'm not going to get specific because I might be talking about a project that I'm doing and I don't want to give any of it away, but I am saying that I understand the importance of being flexible and, you know, maybe figuring out other ways to tell a story and who knows, you know, maybe those, those ways will be, will be better than what you originally planned on. Stay open to that. Um, that's been a really prevalent part of my existence for the past couple of months actually because um, you know I've been messing with anamorphic lenses for example because I thought I was going to shoot this movie in anamorphic mode and I'm not going to do that because after working for a couple of months extensively with an anamorphic lens and anamorphic settings and learning about aspect ratios and stuff like that and doing all the math I realized that ain't serving the story very well and as a matter of fact, I'm almost coming to something that's almost on the complete other end of the spectrum because it's a very intimate story. It doesn't It's not supposed to look like a big, huge Hollywood blockbuster. Like, anamorphic makes it looks like, makes a story look like it costs much more money than it actually did. I mean, in some cases, it did cost that kind of money, but, you know, you can do a story with anamorphic lenses and make it look huge, big, and grand, and, you know, IMAX-like. Um, but that's not what I'm doing with the story that I'm telling right now. And so, I think this is getting a little dark. Hold up for a second. More better? By the way, I'm doing something right now that I would never do on a real project, and that is, I'm speaking to you using autofocus. And I'm actually using a Sigma 28 to 70 f2.8 lens, which I just got, which is another thing that 
shows that I'm being flexible because I am so not the zoom lens guy. But I realized that I needed a really, really, really decent zoom lens for this project because there were certain scenarios where it was just, it just made more sense. It was faster. It was going to get things done. It was kind of like documentary mode. And so the 20 to 60 kit lens that I had wasn't fast enough. Um, it's a great lens, but it just wasn't fast enough. It wasn't serving what I needed. So I got an f2.8, which thank God I have the dual ISO on this camera so I can shoot, you know, when it's not bright enough for general, you know, shooting. But um, anyway, I'm using autofocus right now just to see what happens. So hopefully I stay in focus while I'm talking to you. I don't know. But I would never do that in a real project because I would never trust autofocus to get the job done in a professional setting, in a project that I really care about. I mean, I care about this, but you know, this is the venue to test things, so that's what I'm doing. But nah, you know, I'm about as interested in using autofocus on a real project as I am driving on a highway with cars that have no people in them. Like, I'm not into that kind of automation. I'm, you know, not in my lifetime am I interested in, you know, knowing that there are cars out here that have no people in them. Like, no thank you. So, it's the same thing to me. Like, if I'm shooting and I have other actors on the set with me or I have other people involved, I'm not wasting somebody's time by going, oh, the autofocus screwed up, let's do it again. Nah. You know, also, I'm not trusting that the autofocus knows what my brain is thinking, you know, what I'm trying to do. I mean, autofocus is amazing. I don't want to talk about it too much. So anyway, I'm, I'm doing it now just to test it, see what happens, which this is the right place to do it. So anyway, yeah, be flexible. That's what I'm doing. Um, I'm really, really studying aspect ratio. Um, I watched a movie called Ida the other night. Oh my God, I fell in love with that film. And it's shot in four by three. So it's like old, like old movies, you know, or old TV. You know, it's kind of almost square. Not quite square, but you know, four by three. You know, four high, three across. So it almost makes it look like, you know, you're, you're speaking straight from heaven. You know, you could, you know, make the area above the subject a little bit higher and everything else seems really intimate and kind of closed in and it really keeps your interest on the subject and doesn't include the environment quite as much, but you still can you know, with wide angle lenses include the environment, but it just looks kind of cool. Like I like it, you know, I've been studying that. It's also shot. It's also a black and white film, which I love me some black and white. So yeah, I'm thinking about a lot of things, um, mostly about being flexible. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that. I, I sold my Sony a6400 and, you know, I thought I was going to be a lot more emotional about it, but I'm not really attached to gear like that. Like I just want whatever's going to get the job done, and that's it. You know, I don't really care about anything else. Um, I, I'm grateful to have had that camera. I learned how to use, you know, a proper camera with that piece of equipment. But now I have the Panasonic S5. It's much more capable for what I'm trying to do, and uh, I'm grateful to have it. So um, I sold my Sony a6400, my Sony lenses, the 35 millimeter f1.8 OSS, you know, the APS-C lens and the 55 to 210. And I also sold the Lumix, you know, the Panasonic 20 to 60, and I got this Sigma 28 to 70. And, you know, I, I also got a better tripod because the tripod that I used when I made my film with my phone was fine for an LG V40 phone, but now that I got the S5, I felt like I was playing with fire with that tripod, so I got a better tripod. I'm happy about that. I got some more batteries for the S5. Um, that was necessary. Um, I'm pretty good now, you know, with my Minolta 28mm f2.8, my Minolta Rocor 50mm f1.4, I'm set for this film, including this lens as well, the 28-70. Um, I pretty much have everything I need. I got a great gimbal, the Weeble S, which, you know, is old and not exciting or sexy to anybody anymore, but still a really good gimbal. It does what it has to do. Um, so, yeah, be flexible, be open, you know, let the world, you know, do what it does. You can't control what's going on around you, but you can control your absolute commitment, you know, your non-negotiating self to get the story out no matter what, you know. 
It's like if you're playing basketball, you might see a lane, you know, you might see an opening in the lane, but all of a sudden, some big man steps in front of you, you have to adjust. But what are you trying to do? You're trying to score. So you might have to pass it to somebody, you might have to score a different way, but you can't just do what you were thinking of doing if something else happens that stops you from doing that. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, sports is life too. And speaking of sports, I'm just gonna share this real quick and then I'll get out of here and not make this too long. You know, somebody asked me today, why you gotta talk about racism all the time? Like, why, why you gotta be so intense all the time, you know? Somebody had said something about the Super Bowl and I was like, I'm still boycotting the NFL because ever since Colin Kaepernick, I was out, I was out. And the NFL continues to be a pretty racist organization, you know? The Rooney Rule means nothing. You know, they're supposed to look at black coaches before white coaches when there are openings. They still don't do that. You know, Jeff Saturday got the job with, I think, the Indianapolis Colts recently. You know, Indianapolis didn't look at anybody else. And I'm sure Jeff Saturday is a great coach. He was a great player. But, you know, there are a lot of really great black coaches out there who need the opportunity. You know, I don't think there are any black owners in the league. And, you know, to me, the NFL, the word owner, that's where it's really true, you know? Even though, yeah, these players are making millions and millions of dollars, a lot of them. But when you're playing football, you are literally giving your life to that sport. Literally, you are giving your life to the sport. Um, you know, if you play in the NFL for more than like five or six years, you're probably, your life expectancy, I believe, is like in the early 50s. And, you know, even if you live past that, your body, like, Nobody can withstand that kind of beating. And trust me, I was a football player. I played D1 football in college. My body is messed up from playing football. You know, and if I knew when I was young, what I know now, I never would have played the sport. And I loved the game. But more importantly, you know, why am I always being so serious? And why am I always talking about racism? Just look around the world. Look what's happening, you know? We are still an incredibly racist society, so divided. And any chance I get to bring it up, be sure I'm gonna do that, you know? And if somebody says something about the NFL and I bring up Colin Kaepernick and everybody's like, oh, why you gotta bring that up all the time? Hey, for the exact reason that you just said that, because now everybody's talking about it. Because I still want people, because you know what? They kind of outlasted the Colin Kaepernick situation. Like nobody really cares about it anymore. But did that get fixed? Did it do anything? Did it accomplish anything? So I'm committed to continuing to talk about it, and I, I'll always talk about it. You know, racism, misogyny, homophobia, or anything. Xenophobia, I'm gonna bring it up every single time. I don't care, you know? So I'm not the guy you wanna invite to your party. But um, I heard it was a great Super Bowl. I heard Patrick Mahomes is maybe one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of the game. It's all good, you know? I'm very happy for players like Saquon Barkley, and you know, like, I'm, I'm a Giant fan, but I don't really care about the NFL anymore. I don't care about any of it, you know? Because I do care that there are still people in this world who are not living in the same world as people who look like me. Like if you're a person of color, you do not have the same reality or the same existence, the same safety that I have. And that kind of makes me want to puke. And it always has, you know? So. Yeah, that's what I'm committed to every day of my life. So if you're on this channel and you want to know a little bit more about me, now you know a little bit more about me. And if you go to my website, you'll learn even more about me. And my work is committed to social justice and, you know, meaningful kind of things, you know, because that's just who I am. And um, hate me if you want to. So as I always say, if everybody's not okay, then nobody's okay.